Organist Cameron Carpenter fills concert halls, and yes, he's a showman, but he's also an intensely serious musician. Cameron has a great mission to make the organ a instrument which is popular to take it out of it being just a church organ, but turn it also into a concert organ. I think that's absolutely right. Yeah. I'm a huge fan. Really? Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'd rather drive it than have it there. They're coming to see this very colorful character who can deliver the goods. <laughs> and uh, he certainly can. I was drawn to the organ initially because of a picture in a childcraft encyclopedia when I was four years old, which showed a person playing a, a very beautifully carved cinema organ, not a church organ. Well, I was homeschooled, uh, and that was before homeschooling became a kind of obscure far-right thing. It was really a rather far-left thing, at least in Pennsylvania in the 1980s. Then, at the age of 11, Cameron enrolled in the prestigious American Boy Choir School in Princeton, New Jersey. The American Boy Choir had an immeasurable impact, and, and it certainly conditioned me as a performer not to have any stage fright, not to have any anxiety, um, to have a, you know, to, to place great value on preparation, and organization. And those things as a performer, I can hardly imagine where I'd have gotten them if it hadn't been there. It's been a crossroads for all sorts of things, whether it's um, Giancarlo Minotti's you know, new works being premiered in the 50s, um, or working with Jesse Norman, important recordings, important collaborations with orchestras, with pop musicians, from country singers like Steve Curtis, Stephen Curtis Chapman to Wynton Marsalis, and there was always such a mix of, of repertoire, and I think that was a huge influence on me as well. Dr. James Litt was and is one of my most important and real mentors. He was the director of the American Boy Choir when I was there, and he's, I believe, still the director emeritus. At least he's emeritus in the minds and the hearts of all the boys that he worked with. Cameron Carpenter came here, uh, I think his first year was about 1992. I'll never forget the first day I was up in, upstairs in my office and I su suddenly heard beautiful playing of Rhapsody and Blue by Gershwin. And I thought, who could that be? So I went running down the steps and there was this little kid, about 11 years old, playing the Rhapsody in Blue just marvelously well. So that was Cameron Carpenter. Obviously a great talent. One thing I did do his last year, I sent him home with an organ methods book, which had some very good pedal exercises. And I said, now Cameron, promise me one thing. Read carefully, practice every day those pedal exercises. When he played two years ago, after the concert, he said, now, Dr. Littman, and he said, well, I just want you to know that I did what you, what you asked me to do that summer, and I said, Cameron, it's obvious. <laughs> I don't know how it's humanly possible to do what he's doing with pedal technique. Before a recent concert in Princeton, Cameron visited his old school and met with the current students. It was very inspiring. I like that he came from a s small small school and he becomes this worldwide phenomenon. He said he valued the character that the school builds up in boys. I think that he was really inspirational because he's someone that actually went to ABS and did something great with his life later on. 
Yeah, I think I think it really shows how much you can get to if you really try for something. He played a lot of modern stuff that I've heard that I have on my iPod and a lot of stuff that I've never heard before. It's just really cool to hear him. Some pretty crazy clothes going on there. Yeah, he dresses very interestingly. One of the big challenges touring organists face is that every instrument is different. Every time they play in a new city, they have to quickly learn how to navigate dozens of different mechanisms, stops, pistons, pedals, and often four or five different keyboards. Cameron has come up with an innovative solution. There's one dream, um, which I refer to as the touring organ dream, which is shortly to become a reality, I think, uh, that there's one dedicated organ that I play and it happens to exist in Asia and in uh, America and in Europe. There are three, at least, in fact, three organs, but they're all exactly the same. They're the same physically, they have the same keyboards, they're the same interface and layout, and in fact, they have exactly the same data and sound systems, everything's matching. Organs, by their nature, being an instrument which utilizes, as I said, this concept of an un uninterruptible power supply, are sort of analogous to tapping into a power grid. The problem is that the essence of the great realization of that potential is so seldom reached because many times organists don't push through that boundary of excess to the, to the, the ultimate over-the-top, you know, shocking um, decadence that the organ can provide. It's not that I enjoy pushing the limits, it's that I don't really see that there are any limits.